Girls, and I'm here. Uh, it's five o'clock somewhere, actually it's six o'clock. So I'm having a little martini time. You're welcome to join me. We can have a little discussion about some business things that I think are really important for not only the artists, but for prospective clients as well. So let's get going. I had to wet my whistle first. So first of all, the reason why I did this video is because a couple things have happened over the last couple days that have really concerned me. And I think it's just important to discuss. Um, it's about booking gigs. <clears throat> and excuse my voice because I was just getting over cold from last week and had to sing through a lot of gigs. And so my voice is like really, really low. I'm beginning to sound like Suzanne Plachette. But um, anyway, so a couple things happened this week that were concerning to me. Um, number one, I had sent out an email to a client who had emailed me for some information and I emailed her back and didn't hear back from her. That was like two months ago and I just got an email today saying, oh, I didn't realize you emailed me back. It was in my spam folder. I didn't see it. Another client, same thing. I had sent her five different responses to something about a pricing, didn't hear back, assumed maybe it wasn't happening. And then she called me this morning and was like, I haven't heard from you. Are you going to do the gig? And I'm like, I've emailed you like five times back to the email I got yours from. So I knew I had the correct email address. But again, it went to her spam folder. Now, I myself have started to check the spam folder every day. I check it every day. I just kind of, you know, give a glance through. Usually I get about, I don't know, 25 to 30 spam items, but sometimes one or two of them is not spam, and I'm glad that I caught it because that could cost me business. So if you're running a business and you are doing a lot of just emailing with your information, I just want to warn you that sometimes your clients are not even getting your emails because you've been sitting in the spam folder and they never got your information. So, uh, one other thing, um, on Facebook, I've been over the 5,000 limit friends on my Facebook now for the last, I don't know, four or five years. <clears throat> Once in a while, it lets me add a new friend, but for the most part, it only allows me to do that for a, a few people. So, again, I had no idea. One day, I just happened to push something on Facebook, and all of a sudden, these Facebook text messages came up from people that I wasn't friends with. So if they sent me a Facebook text, it was sitting in some folder that needed me to accept them or accept the text in order to read it and respond. Uh, I had about 250 of those sitting in that folder that went back to 2012. I had no idea they were there. And there were several that were people inquiring about gigs and I was embarrassed that, oh, these people just think I blew them off. And that wasn't the case at all. So here's the thing. If you really want to conduct business in a positive and productive way, I wouldn't email something to a first-time client. If you're inquiring about a booking, pricing, uh, needing information, call call first call the number on there either the office number or john or mine cell it's listed on different things and once we've connected then if you want me to e email you something you know you can go ahead and, and make sure that you put my email uh into your non-spam folder that it allows you, you go into a certain setting and it says you know allow email from this from this particular person email address so um, that is so important. And, and I think, you know, I've been in the business for 25 years and I have noticed <clears throat> over the last, it's got to be at least 10 years, we've become a society that doesn't want to talk on a phone. They don't want to talk in person. Everybody wants to just text. I mean, <laughs> we're texting each other from different rooms in the house. It's ridiculous. But especially for business, if you're looking for something from a uh, business, especially your first contact, don't rely on an email or a text because you don't know if they got it or not. So I would suggest make sure you call the phone number and that you connect vocally first. That way we're able to take care of you as a client the best way we can. 
We're able to answer any of your questions. We're able to talk about what your needs are. Um, one thing that just irritates me to no end is when I get a text or uh, an email from somebody that says, how much do you charge? <laughs> it depends on what you want. It depends on what day of the week it is. It depends on how far I have to travel. It depends on how big your venue is. I'm not going to charge the same as I would for a 75-seat club than I would for a theater that seats 1,300 people. That just makes common sense. I need to know how long you want me to play. If it's a private party or a corporate function or, or a wedding, for instance, weddings are a completely different price than what somebody's going to go into a little bar and play for their three hours in the evening. A wedding, you're not only having to meet with the client uh, sometimes several times before even the wedding to go over what songs they want. Perhaps you need to learn a special song for the bride and groom's dance or you need to download some music that they want played by a particular artist or for uh, you know the, the wedding dancers or special things that they want played. Um, you're also meeting with them to go over what are the announcements that you want and how do you pronounce the names correctly and so forth. Uh, you're also going to find out that when you get to the venue, uh, what time is their cocktail hour? Sometimes a wedding uh, will have you come and they want you to play eight to midnight or you know, 7 to 11, but cocktail hour starts at 5, so they're going to want you to be there, set up and sound check before any of their guests come through the door. Who would want a band setting up and a drummer, you know, if you've got a full band, doing sound checks and things when your guests are there? No, you're going to want all that done before your guests arrive, so it'll be a classy professional event. But your band or your artists, whatever entertainment you've hired, they're going to need to be there earlier in the day to do all of that before those doors open and then they're basically sitting there until their performance time starts. So then you got to think about are we providing them meals? It's kind of the professional and nice thing to do since they've come and set up and uh, you know a lot of musicians they've got other they're not doing this full-time. A lot of them have full-time regular day jobs and they're doing music on the side and sometimes they've had to uh, take off from their day job in order to uh, meet your requirements to be set up and sound checked by a certain time. So all that gets taken into consideration when you are pricing an event. You know, if you're you're going to something that's right in your backyard, you can get to it within 10-15 minutes. Your setup is fairly quick. You do your three hours. Your your setup is you know, your teardown is is quick, and you don't have much to drive home. You're going to give a different price than you would having to drive an hour to some place. And if you're having like a three-piece or a four-piece uh, act, there's sound checks and a, and a lot more things to be carrying in and so forth. So that all needs to be taken into consideration. So you can't just say, what's your price? <laughs> because it's like asking a builder, how much can you build a house for? What's your price? Well, how big of a house are you building? Is it three bedroom, four bedroom, five bedroom? How much square footage? Are we doing a finished basement? Are we putting in a pool? You know, it, I mean, it's just common sense. You can, there's no flat rate for entertainment. You have to consider a lot of things. And the best way that we can negotiate a price that works for the both of us is for us to get every detail of information that we can from you so, so that there's no surprises, there's no arguing at the end of the evening, well, I thought you wanted this or I thought you were going to do blah, blah, blah. It's all discussed beforehand, and that's so much easier to do over the phone or in person than emailing back and forth and, and, and even emails and text. I've lost some gigs because something was interpreted the wrong way. I, when I texted something, in my mind, it was in this nice singy-songy voice. They took it in a very, in a nasty tone, I guess. And that's the other reason why I don't like texting and I don't like emailing back and forth for business until after you've already talked about everything, then it's okay to say, okay, I would like to email you our contract and, you know, make sure you look it over. On the top of all my contracts, it says, be sure that you read this contract thoroughly and that all the dates, the times, all the little extra things, like if meals are being provided or uh, drinks and so forth, everything spelled out and if you have any questions at all or if there's something that's not what we discussed or it's wrong information call us call the office directly so that we can take care of it 
So we don't have any issues on the day of your event. We want it to be a successful, great event for you. And when that happens, you're happy, we're happy, your, your fans, customers, uh, guests, they're happy too because it's all run smoothly and it should be a win-win situation for everybody involved. So I can't stress enough to please call the number that's on all the advertisements <clears throat> for any time that you are um, asking about uh, a, a gig and inquiring about a booking because it can go much easier and quicker if you just call on the phone. And then after that, you can email back and forth. All right. Anyway, let's see. What else? Oh, okay. Here's another thing that and I need. I need to take a sip of my martini for this one. It's just another irritant. <laughs> Nothing drives a professional artist crazy than being compared to another group especially one that hasn't had the successes that you have who doesn't have the following you have it's it's like comparing apples to oranges so if a club says well so-and-so will come in for hundred fifty dollars for four hours and they don't take a break so what okay you know you can have groups that'll come in for free because this isn't what they do for a living they're doing it part-time Sometimes it's just a hobby and they're just anxious to play and they'll do anything to go out and get that time in the, in the you know, limelight and be heard. But if, you've, if you're an accomplished artist and you've performed all over the country and you've done theaters and you've done uh, voiceovers and you've done you know, big events, weddings to uh, casinos, um, you cannot you cannot expect to pay the same amount of money for that artist who obviously has had success because of their talent and people like it and they're having a good following and you're, they're going to bring you business and you're going to enjoy what you're hearing because there's a lot of acts that'll come in for on the cheap and you get what you pay for the old saying you get what you pay for so when their sound system sucks when they play too loud when they just don't have, you know, the vocal talent and you're seeing people in the audience kind of rolling their eyes or they're leaving because they're not enjoying it for whatever the reason is. If you found a artist who is doing a good job, they show up on time. Their equipment is top notch and, and that's really important because I've been to more than a few uh, places where I've seen no matter what, if it's whether a solo duo or a full band, if you don't have good equipment, your sound is everything. It can make or break you. You put Celine Dion on a cheap, crappy sound system, she ain't going to sound as good as she does with the system that she gets over there at Caesars Palace or when she goes on the road to, to big venues. So your sound is everything, and that's something that you should um, take into consideration. And it's a great investment to have really good sound. Good microphones that you can hear that you're not being drowned out by your band members. That is so important. Back in the day when I had a full band, <clears throat> I was blowing my voice out every weekend because I was having to over sing and sing a much louder and harder just to hear myself, let alone what was coming out the front speakers to the audience. And you know, you gotta have a band that realizes if, if you're the big draw as the lead singer, and you know not that the band isn't important they're they deserve their kudos as well but you know you don't have Steve Perry with Journey um, having the band playing so loud that they're drowning out him out or he's blowing his voice and then can't do gigs because his voice is blown so um, that's important too you have to take into consideration when you have professionals they know that if you're good you don't have to be loud okay you want to be at a comfortable level you want it to be at a level where, um, especially if it's a party, um, that it's at a, a, an excitement kind of level where you, they hear it and they're feeling the music, but not dr drowning out uh, the audience or that you can't even talk to somebody across the table, you're having to shout because the music's so loud. That doesn't fly with me. I don't like that. Um, if you're at a place that is fine dining or a dining establishment where you know, you're kind of like background, easy listening kind of music, Play appropriately. Don't don't you know blow everybody out of the water, 
uh, with, with being really loud. It's irritating to your audience and it's irritating to the club owner as well who keeps getting complaints from the customers that they can't hear each other and the band's too loud. So just things to take into consideration. You know, if you found somebody who sounds really good and who's making your customers happy, pay them a little bit more because they deserve it. And it doesn't matter whether it's a solo, a duo, a trio, or a 12-piece band. You can have a 12-piece band that sounds like crap and your your customers are walking out because it's it's just not jiving or you know whatever the issues is the lead singer can't sing the harmonies are off the band's too loud uh, you know whatever the issue is you can't you can't pay a group based on numbers of people um, this has really been um, a thing over the years because somebody will say well you know I pay a five piece band you know five hundred dollars but uh, you know, if you come in solo, then I can only pay you like a hundred. You're like, it, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even make sense. You can make more, you know, playing for a local nursing home in the afternoon for 45 minutes, and you, you just, you can't, you can't do that. I have always said, not that I think I'm Elvis Presley or anything, but I've always said, if Elvis Presley came back from the dead, and he agreed to play at a bar nearby, would they pay him less than they would the five-piece band? No, because he's Elvis Presley. So you got to take into consideration as to what this person has achieved. Do they have a good following? Have they made a name for themselves? Are they professional? Are they starting on time? Are they taking the appropriate breaks? And are they not drinking you out of house and home? Which is another issue that comes up. If you're a band or any artist, don't take advantage of the drink uh, accommodations that the uh, venue is giving you it's a privilege that's a privilege that they give you so that you know you're not only going home with your pay but they may provide you a light meal or your drinks so we don't take advantage of that if somebody says we're gonna give you a meal we don't order steak and lobster or the most expensive thing on the menu we try to get something that's you know within reason and I don't think that it's um, you know, unexpected for a grown-up to be able to have one drink a set. I think you can handle that. And a lot of times if it's, you know, the house wine or some sort of cocktail that isn't, you know, you're not ordering Blue Label Scotch or something, that's a big difference. So, you know, keep that stuff in mind because when you abuse it, then club owners get upset and they're like, forget it. We're not providing anybody that we're hiring anymore with meals or alcohol. You're on your own you ruin it for the people who are doing the professional thing. So uh, it's it makes a lot happier relationship with a club owner uh, if you are being respectful and appreciative uh, of any kind of food and beverage privileges that they give you. Um, what else, what else can we talk about? I just wanna get back to um, pricing again. Um, from an artist standpoint or a band, when you go into do bookings, don't undersell yourself. You're setting yourself up for just being on the cheap. Once you go too cheap, you'll never get back up to what you deserve to be paid. So um, if you're, even if you're doing this for just a hobby, don't go in on the cheap because you're not only hurting yourself, but you're hurting the other professional musicians who are out there who are making a living with this full time and this has been a full-time job for me for the last 25 years and it is easily 60 to 80 hours a week I know I sound like a broken record with my family when I say that but it truly is like having two full-time jobs because if you're doing this full-time you can't afford to you know unless you're really really big time and you're being you're traveling all over the United States and you're doing regular theater work and things like that you cannot afford to pay a bookkeeper and a marketing person and promo and uh, somebody to do um, you know writing and production of your shows and you know there's just so many different areas of this business that we have to spend time on behind the scenes that people don't realize so you know a lot of people go well you know why would I pay you that you're only singing for three hours well but there's the travel time DUI crackdown oh that has really hurt the bars and restaurants 
back in the day it used to be that restaurants would have their normal dinner crowd and then they counted on the entertainment to keep people there or bring the other new people in turntables for the 9 to 1 or 10 to 2 and having some you know snacks along with the drinks and that has just not happened anymore who's going to be out after 10 11 o'clock because the cops are sitting out there pulling over you for, for no really good reason other than they can come up with an excuse as to why they pulled you over and give you a ticket and that can be a very very expensive and horrible situation to get a DUI so um, you know a lot of places are going six to nine or seven to ten uh, for to have their entertainment and just hope that you bring in your fans and friends for um, dinner hour and some drinks and it kind of had to move the cheese and it's a whole different thinking uh, we've had some club owners that nope we're still gonna do that you know we're gonna do nine to one and by eleven o'clock the place is cleared out because they're not going to risk getting a DUI even if they've only had one drink. So um, that's just been something that I've seen a big change, especially over the last you know three years or so, that they're finally getting it and saying we're just going to do things at an earlier time, and um, that's that's helped quite a bit. But uh, yeah, it's been a it's it's just been a humongous change. Back in the 70s and 80s, bands were being paid 12 to $1,500 or more at a local place, you know, playing that night at 1 or 10 to 2. And sometimes they'd ask you to stay for an extra hour till 3 o'clock, and we'd be coming home <laughs> with the sun's rising, and the kids are getting up, and it's like, oh, God. <laughs> so um, that's just not happening. Bands are not really being paid that um, for a lot of various reasons as we just discussed but don't go in and undersell yourself because you're not only hurting yourself but you're hurting the other professionals who are out there you know putting a lot more time and effort into it than the folks who are just doing it as a hobby and you know again you just can't compare it it's apples to oranges and um, you know club owners really need to take that into consideration and be fair and you know if you are an artist and you go in and you negotiate uh, a decent price that that you can agree with and uh, it happens to be a slow night because in this business sometimes there's no rhyme or reason but if you happen to have a slow night then you work with your customer you give them a break on the price uh, and it goes both ways if it's an exceptionally great night you hope that the club owner will also do the same and tip you um, so uh, that's just a few things that I think are really important in uh, the music business both for artists and club owners uh, and also you know different venues and so forth um, I welcome any of your questions I welcome your advice I welcome suggestions and you know share with me um, some things that you would like to talk about here on my channel in regards to the music business music business <laughs> I can say that I only had one sip geez <laughs> all right thanks for visiting my channel I hope you found this not only entertaining but educational and um, if I can help make a change in any way that I can for the better for um, my fellow musicians I am glad that I'm doing these so um, go out and support your local music regional artists even the bigger artists just support live music because it's hard to come by anymore. All right, you guys, have a great evening. God bless. Can't you see what I am?